Good evening and welcome to this panel discussion of Art in the Moment, a special KR online project led by our Kenyon Review Fellow in Prose, Misha Rai, and Kenyon Review Associate, Virginia Kane. I'm Elizabeth Dark, Associate Director of Programs for the Kenyon Review, and we are delighted to have you with us this evening. Before we begin, I will share a few things with you to help usher you through your time with us. If you would like to access closed captioning for this evening, you may do so by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. And if at any point you experience technical difficulties, please email kenyonreview at kenyon.edu where a staff member is waiting to assist you. I'll take a quick moment to point you to our reading series calendar in hopes that you'll join us again soon for another Kenyan Review reading, the next of which occurs on May 4th when Tiana Clark will be with us for a reading. Her reading will mark the final event in connection with our project, In My Time in Narrative Space, our year-long invitation to engagement with literature and creative writing during this pandemic year of uncertainty, grief, and distance. I'm also happy to share with you information about the Kenyon Review's new Ross event series, which will be running online this summer in correspondence with our Kenyon Review Writers Workshops. This series will include 22 events consisting of conversations and readings from, from some of the best living writers today, and this month we are running an early bird special that you will not want to miss. Follow the link in the chat to view our new and beautiful webpage and learn more about these events. And now I will invite Virginia Kane to join me. Virginia Kane is a queer poet from Alexandria, Virginia, and a junior at Kenyon College, where she studies English, creative writing, and women's and gender studies. The intern for Art in the Moment, Virginia also serves as a Kenyon Review editorial associate and the editor in chief of Sunset Press. Her debut poetry chat book, If Organic Deodorant Was Made for Dancing, was selected at the inaugural release for Sunset Press in 2019, and her work has appeared or is forthcoming in Kenyon Review Blog, the Susquehanna Review, Dust Poetry Magazine, and the SWWIN Every Day. Virginia. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and thank you to everyone who's joined us so far. It's now my pleasure to introduce Misha Rai, who has edited and curated the entire Art in the Moment series, really from its origins. Misha Rai, currently the Kenyan Review Fellow in Prose, is a Shirley Jackson Award nominated writer whose novel in progress has received support from the Whiting Foundation, the U Cross Foundation, McDowell, the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and the Dana Award in the novel category. She is the first ever and only fiction writer to be awarded a Woodrow Wilson Dissertation Fellowship in Women's Studies for Creative Work. An Edward H. and Mary C. Kingsbury Fellow, she is the recipient of the George M. Harper Award. Her essay, To Learn About Smoke, One Must First Light a Fire, winner of the Dogwood Literary Prize in Nonfiction, is listed as a notable essay in the 2019 Best American Essays Anthology. Her prose appears in a number of journals and anthologies. She was born in Sonipat, Haryana and brought up in India where she first worked as a journalist and then later in human rights for the National Human Rights Commission, the International Labor Organization and on projects run by the Ministry of Women and Child India and the UNICEF. Personally, I feel deeply grateful to have grown under her guidance through all of the energy and knowledge she's invested in this project in so many different stages and her endless kindness and encouragement as a mentor and educator. Misha. Thank you so much, Virginia. And like, I did not know you were going to do the last bit there. So that was, that sort of is really moving. Um, and I just, before I invite the other panelists in, I wanted to kind of say that uh, it has been a joy to put this project together, especially with Virginia, who like helped co-curate a lot of the work and brought us writers that I hadn't been paying attention to, like Ahmed Amala and reminded me about S.J. Sindhu, who's just a brilliant writer. Um, and it is a joy to have some of our panelists joining us today, especially since we've got panelists from Italy, where it's like 1 a.m., and Pakistan, where it's 4 a.m. And I'm really grateful to everybody who has chosen to participate in this. Um, I'm, I'm going to start introducing our panelists. Allegra Hyde is the author of This New World, which won the John Simmons Short Fiction Award. 
Her writing has been anthologized in Best American Travel Writing, Best of the Net, Best Small Fictions, as well as the Pushcart Prize. She has received fellowships and grants from the Bread Loaf Writers Conference, the Elizabeth George Foundation, the Lucas Artist Residency Program, the Gentle Foundation, and the US Fulbright Commission. Her debut novel, and I'm sorry, Allegra, if I'm gonna butcher this. Um, do you wanna pronounce it for me, please? Eleutheria. Okay. Eleutheria, along with a second short story collection, are forthcoming from Vintage. She currently teaches at Oberlin College. Hello, Allegra. <laughs> Alessandra Raveggi is an Italian novelist and research fellow at the Università Ca Foscari Venezia. He also teaches literature at New York University and is the editor in chief of at the FLR, which is the Florentine Literary Review, the first Italian bilingual literary magazine. His last novel in, is Grand Karma published by Bompiani, I hope I'm not butchering this, I'm so sorry, Alessandro, in 2020 and, nom and was the nominee for the 2021 Stre Strega Prize. He has published articles in Italian, Spanish, and English for Wired, Esquire, Forbes, A Simport Journal, Letras Libres, and Revi Revista Universidad. Hi, Alessandro, I'm so sorry if I butchered stuff. Ciao, ciao. Hello, everyone. Zane, Zane Saeed earned his MFA at the University of Texas at Austin. His debut novel, Little America, will be published by the Penguin Random House India in June 2021. His work has appeared in Glimmer Train, The Hindu, and Freiburg Review, among others. He lives in Karachi, Pakistan, where he teaches creative writing and literature at Habib University. Welcome, Zane. Jessica Reedy is a writer and educator with works in narrative magazine. Um, narrative magazine, a story of the week, Prairie Schooner, and other publications. She is the winner of the Nancy Thorpe Poetry Prize, the Penelope Nevins Award for Creative Nonfiction, and the Glenna Luchet Prize. And her work has been nominated for a Pushcart and Best of the Net. She's co host of Romanistan podcast alongside Paulina Verminsky, which is a celebration of Roma lives and outcasts. Under the name of Jasmina Wompiel, she's a dancer, healer, artist, an art model, and fortune teller, dealing in tarot palmistry and tea leaves. Um, we do have one more panelist um, who hasn't joined us yet, but I hope she will. So I'm just going to read out her bio. Um, Huma Sheikh is a doctoral fellow in creative writing at Florida State University, the recipient of fellowships from Callaloo, William Joyner Institute, University of Massachusetts at Hamhurst, East West Center. She has studied literary nonfiction with Christina Thompson at Harvard and worked as a journalist in India, China, and the United States. She was the assistant online editor for the Southeast Review, fiction screener for Horizon Books, stringer and reporter for Plain Talk Weekly and Carlio Newspapers in South Dakota and Hawaii. The winner of the Adam M. Johnson Fellowship, Charles Gordon Award and the Dean's Award for Outstanding Academic Performance and the Award for Excellence in English at Long Island University, Huma is currently working on her memoir and poetry book. Her work has appeared in Consequence Magazine, Arismith Journal and Rumpus and is forthcoming in other places. I'm hoping she'll join us soon, but hello to all the panelists again. Um, I'm just going to like, for the people who've joined us and who have not yet had the opportunity to read art in the moment, um, I thought I would give a overview about it. It was born um, out of an impetus to comment on the 2020 US presidential elections. Um, we were having this conversation about, at, in the Kenyan Review, we were having a conversation about how do we engage with the elections and what will those election results mean for the people who live in this country and also in other countries. Um, and then in a conversation that I had with Nicole Therese Dutton, who is our esteemed editor, and Molly McCauley Brown, who makes the other half of this fellowship um, and is just wonderful, we had a conversation about similar things, like what does the vote mean? And at some point, I made a throwaway comment about the fact that, you know, in countries like India, your the vote that you cast is doesn't always is always influenced by foreign policy like what's happening in other countries sort of affects the way that we uh, cast our vote and that sort of like Nicole picked up on that and she's like that's interesting because we're planning to do a hopefully an entire series on the vote like why don't we do another series that looks at like how these things get unpacked and that meant that I could do what I love doing which is like reach out to writers from around the world and ask us to be in conversation about the vote and the democracy um, in the end, actually, the other thing that inspired this piece was Honore Jeffers' essay on like things ain't always going to be this way. And that essay is really about the vote in Georgia. 
Um, so that's sort of the overview of where we're coming from. And then we were like, Virginia and I did this thing where we were very lucky. We got to read a lot of work from different artists. Like multi we got to see multimedia art. We got to see sort of essays and short fiction. We, we got to like really do a deep, di deep dive. And we sent out invitations to a lot of artists asking them to uh, participate in this. And we feel very lucky for the people who did. Um, so I'm going to start us off by just saying thank you to the panelists who are here today, um, to all of them, and especially the ones who've turned up at 1, 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. <laughs> thank you so much for that. Um, and I guess I'm just going to start with a simple question, which is, um, in the process of writing your essays, I'm curious about what got left out. I know when I was writing the introduction, um, I wrote about newspapers and I wrote about um, what I saw when I was in Florida um, and my interaction with Gilbert King, but I know there were so many things I wanted to talk about, like so many other ways in which the vote has informed my life or in the ways that certain influences or certain incidents have informed my life. And I'm just curious um, to find out what was left on the editing block, I guess. And please jump in. Sure, Alessandra. Yeah, well, I was thinking that, uh, and first of all, thank, thank you. Thank you, Misha. Thank you to the King Review to, uh, for this uh, publication, for this uh, special uh, event that I really like. And uh, when, as an editor of a bilingual Italian magazine that wants to support the, you can say, the, the diffusion of the Italian literature abroad, I feel it's hard for Italian literature to, Seems not, not so hard, but it's, I think my opinion is hard for, for writers and poets to be abroad. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to uh, share my experience no, as an Italian. But I think probably the two things that I drop when I start writing the, the I don't know if you can say essay, memoir, I don't know, depends on the genre that you want to uh, apply on, on my on my piece I don't know <laughs> like a, a, a theatrical play but I mean is the probably my experience abroad not as a voter but uh, having I mean I I was living in Mexico I have I mean I've been working at New York University since 2015 so I mean I have a not only an Italian experience. I mean, I live in, uh, as I said, jet lag. So for, for me, being high, 1 a.m. it's okay. <laughs> after, after a pandemic semester last, last year with the New York University students that I was uh, waking up and they uh, were like in their pajamas waiting for my class. I mean, anyway, uh, is the, not an American, probably not, but the Mexican experience that I had because I was uh, kind of a correspondent for Italy when I was in Mexico. And for me, it was really interesting to see how the Mexican people were, um, I mean, considering the right to vote, uh, their history, and you start comparisons. No? I mean, when you are abroad, the first thing that you do, compare your country and to the Mexican one. And there were similarities. Uh, Mexico was a country controlled by only one party for, for, for from the revolution till still probably the, the late, I mean, thousand, and they, it was like uh, interesting that in Italy was kind of similar with mm -hmm. the, not a one one party, two political parties, and this obviously uh, kind of make a difference, no, in the the experience of a voter, the fact mm -hmm. that you are in a sense controlled by only one party. No, it's an experience that you can have in the history of many countries, European countries, not only European countries, and. And the other thing that was uh, probably interesting to uh, the fact that, I mean, voting is an act of faith in your country. And we, the Italians, we have still issues with, with the, the patriotism, as you know, probably, because we had this terrible experience of Mussolini and, and fascism that we kind of a, a nightmare that was still kind of a, a very long shadow. And in, uh, in Mexico, there's a kind of a positive, we can say patriotism that, that is similar, but not compared to the one that you probably find in America. And uh, for me, it's really hard to, to, to feel like a, a patriot. No? So this is why I choose to describe the experience of someone who had a fresh experience of, as a voter, that is my father, 
in my in my text because I had a kind of a experience that is far from the experience of patriotism that can be also voting no just defend your democracy for Italians uh, the, the, the word nation is negative uh, the, the showing the flag I mean what we, we only use the flag as probably you know when we won the the world uh, championship no the, <laughs> but it, it right, was football. like uh, 20 uh, I don't know 50 years ago <laughs> so we, Italian Italian football was better than today so <laughs> and uh, but it was like a, a sign of uh, I mean not fascism but almost like that so uh, again probably just to, to just close and uh, the today I feel that after my experience in Mexico and abroad and uh, the experience of, uh, of voting it has kind of enriched the value and also uh, I understand a little bit that you can be kind of a patriotic. You can be, I mean, like without being a fascist. I don't know. <laughs> this no, that's great. The thing Thank that you. I try to, to write, no? And the, the thing that I dropped. That's great. Thank you so much. Especially like Thank um, you. just like finding out the experience between Mexico and Italy. That's that's fascinating. Yeah. Thank you for telling that. Well, Something that I feel like I didn't get to address as much as I would have liked in my essay was a little more detail about the current human rights crisis for Roma, especially in Europe. Because when you're trying to get in everything, I think it can make it begin to sound a little bit like glazed over or, mm -hmm. or impersonal, where I'm just sort of listing, listing like, you know, housing inequality and lack of education access and like healthcare inequality and forced sterilization and just like it's just <laughs> running down a list of all these horrible things. Mm. Um, and so I've been trying to um, raise awareness about some more specific issues like, um, you know, right now um, in Italy, actually, there's uh, this huge issue with Roma homes being destroyed and fascist attacks. And there are a lot of Roma left homeless without any access to like sanitation or clothing or all of these basic essentials. And so there are a few little like grassroots organizations um, uh, doing work for that. And so it's very hard for Roma to get into politics and to have a voice when there's still so much um, violence and oppression. Um, and Something else that I left out of the essay that I didn't realize I did because I only just found out about this candidate now, but I had been saying in the essay how there really is little to no political representation of Roma. Um, Roma are not acknowledged as uh, an ethnic group in the US, even though there are a lot of us. Um, and I found Salem Snow is a candidate uh, running for Congress and he's based in Philadelphia. And he worked on um, the Bernie campaign and he had people telling him that he should run for office. He had experienced a lot of housing instability in his life. And uh, when gentrifiers showed up in Kensington, one of the poorest areas in Philly where he was living, he helped um, organize neighborhood opposition. And because the project, the building project would um, you know, completely displace people in the neighborhood. And he did so much work organizing it and realized that, you know, the corruption was running so deep that maybe he really should run for office. And, you know, he kept in mind that, you know, Romani history isn't taught in U.S. schools. It's our representation is vital to our survival for that reason. And um, I just really love his passion and his platforms are really interesting. Um, he brings up that even though the US government doesn't legally recognize Roma as a people, there are still a number of like anti-gypsy laws and um, you know, points out things like 41% of Roma don't have indoor plumbing and 90% um, of Roma uh, households live in poverty and these are like astronomical numbers. So he really is passionate about um, equal access to healthcare, food, water, utilities. He's um, very like working class issues focused and human rights focused. And I was really excited to discover him and talk about him. And so if I had known that he existed, I would have put him in in a heartbeat, but now I can tell you guys. 
I think this is the this I think there's been this interesting thing that's happened is like after writing the essay like my own introductory essay I thought I found more things that I was interested in mm-hmm. and I you you touch on that really wonderfully but also I think you you and Alessandro are touching on something um, that's again interesting to me in the way that we could write about so many things right like you think about what the genre of an essay is like are we writing memoir are we writing memory like you know Alessandro is writing memory right he's writing his father's memory because his own seems pessimistic in a way or the fact that you have so much to put in but when you put all of that in do we lose some of the power of what makes storytelling so fascinating the storytelling in essay form right like I had a student today tell me that she preferred nonfiction to fiction because she knew that the writer had lived through that form of nonfiction, and it was interesting to me because I had thought about that but as primarily a fiction writer like I was like, really like nonfiction, but that's the power of nonfiction, right? That's the power of essays. That's the power of like this particular project to realize that through essays, through social, this sort of, this anthology, which is clearly geared towards social justice, we are capable of changing people's mind. Like for everyone's essays, I've gotten like comments and I've been rubbish at sending to you guys, but I will send those to you. Um, But this is, and also the connection between like what's happening in the United States and what's happening in Italy between the Roma, right? What about you, Zane and Allegra? Like, are there things that you guys left out in, during the editing process? I'm glad you mentioned storytelling and the stuff that we kind of leave out in order to tell a story. I think it sounds a little weird, but I think what I left out really was actually talking about the vote. Um, I avoided it for the duration <laughs> of that essay for several reasons. Um, and I think the, the largest of it being that I didn't want it to turn into a weird gothic horror um, <laughs> essay because that's where it would have gone if I'd actually talked about the vote. Um, because it, it's, it's something that in this part of the world doesn't really get talked about in, in academic settings as much or it doesn't really get talked about in, in I, guess, I guess, writing um, because usually it's just the conversations on the vote or democracy in general, they're usually met with shrugs or they're usually spoken of in, in classes where people are talking about how bad it is and how it's really not something you can talk about because it's just these things just happen and they keep happening. And there doesn't seem to be a kind of foundation in place for these conversations to happen. So that when you approached me with this idea of writing about the vote, I, I was stumped. I, I was I was like, I don't know what I'm going to write about because I don't really think about the vote um, because it's not some, all of our activism seems to happen outside of, you know, the institutions and outside of, um, you know, established kind of ways of electing representatives and whatnot. I don't even know who the elected representative from my area is because nobody seems to know who it is. Uh, because those people just show up when they they're like, oh, you're the guy. No, okay, wonderful. Um, and nobody seems to know who they are. Uh, so yeah, a lot of that I left out because I didn't want it to become morbid. Um, and yeah, so I just began thinking more along the lines of you know ideas of freedom and what it means to to be free um, in in this part of the world. Uh, and right now, the answer to that is pretty skewed because um, when you compare it to you know the the two and a half three years that I spent in the US where where the conversations on the vote or conversations on democracy were very very different um I mean I know you used the word pessimistic when um uh, describing what Alessandro was saying and uh, it was it was I guess in that way optimistic in the US where people you know talk about the vote like something that has power and something that will actually bring change and something that will lead to something uh, whereas, at least in my experience, conversations here have always been completely the opposite, as it's something that won't actually change anything, something that, you know, you'll have to, if you want to bring about change, you'll have to go, you'll have to take this kind of roundabout route to bring about that change. So, yeah, I just didn't talk about the vote, and that's, that's what I left out. I'm so glad I asked this question then, because like th- this is not an answer I was expecting. I felt like in your essay, you do talk about it, but in a roundabout way, which makes sense. Mm-hmm. And I empath- I completely understand what you're talking about, because India is the same. In India, all the conversations I have are frustrating conversations, because I think some of the optimism of, of Americans has rubbed off on me, where I do believe that the vote matters and the change, you know, that if you work 
hard enough and you have enough hope in your heart, you can actually make change happen. And I feel like the US elections that have just gone by have, are like sort of um, clearly embody what I believe in. But in India, yeah, it's like every time Modi is up for an election, it's it's this moment where you're having this conversation and a lot of my friends are, or you know, older people, just any generation I talk to, We'll talk like there's there's no point because the same person's going to get elected or like we have a choice between electing a man who's clearly heinous and we know he's clearly heinous but we're going to elect him because there's nobody else that is going to stand up for him stand up to him and if you just if you even have a conversation about how there are all these other people and in small ways in small structural ways we could make change happen um, India is a multi-party system, but everybody assumes if you don't vote for BJP, you're going to vote for Cong Congress, which is a shit show, because really we're multi-party, although in the last few years, you know, it has felt like we're a two-party country. So I appreciate you bringing up the fact that, you know, there is a ambivalence. There's also this acceptance of the fact that nothing's going to change, so why try? And that, again, I think these essays, like, they really matter. Like, I think the language, I mean, even you bringing in the piece of text that you brought in that really mattered like you know through that lens that we're looking at um in pakistan and we're looking at the elections in pakistan or the vote of what democracy means allegra what about you uh well i mean first i just want to say thank you for including me and um it's been a, a pleasure to read everyone's essay and um i'm really glad to be here with uh my fellow panelists um, so, I mean, my essay <laughs> was uh, probably uh, a, a dose of American optimism <laughs> um, and uh, for better or worse. And I think what I ended up leaving out were, were probably three things. One was the experience of being a child and going to uh, a voting booth with my parents and just having that kind of consecrate the act as a um, a special and important thing to do. Uh, the second thing that I left out was current current events. Um, uh, I think it was interesting to write this essay after the elections had happened, after you know an endless series of hot takes happening in the media, and then to write something that's about voting that's not a hot take um, was a, an interesting challenge. Um, and so there's so much to say about um uh restrictions around voting that are happening right now and just current events around voting but could not uh, accommodate that in the in the essay um and the third thing that i did not include but did a, a deep dive on was uh was with respect to just my interest in a collective consciousness and just uh, collective experience i actually did a lot of research on slime molds um <laughs> and because i was just i don't know in a internet rabbit hole of um I don't know, an organism that is thinking collectively and doesn't have a uh, and it's kind of making decisions on mass and <laughs> it would have been interesting to bring in that that material but uh <laughs> it felt like a little bit too much so that's what that's what got left out I feel like that's an essay you should send to the review, regardless. I think you should send it to us because it would be wonderful to read. Um, but also, like, thank you. I, I really appreciated, like, the moment in your essay where Obama turns up in the essay. And there's your friend who's, like, talking about I should have given him my coffee. And I was like, yes, you should have given, your, given him your coffee. But I was also like, this is sort of just the... It was wonderful um, because of the range of the essays. And I'm so sad that Huma can't be here because Huma Sheikh's essay, which is going to come out, which is the last essay that's about to come out, is a really fascinating essay. It's specifically about Kashmir, but also a thing happened to her after she wrote that essay. She, um, she realized she would have to leave the country. She'd have to leave India because she could get arrested. And I think I realized in that moment when I got that email from her, the urgency, the necessity of why we write these essays that we write, because they matter to people. And, and they are just, you know, like they matter to people and also they matter to governments. There's a reason why like the Indian government after Modi came to power, they went after artists first. They sort of tried to silence the artists first because, you know, the word really matters, like slogans matter, those kinds of things matter. So I'm really grateful for all your essays and the different takes on, you know, the essays that you've taken. I feel like Virginia has a question here. Yeah, um, well, as I spent time with each of your essays this year, I noticed several of you were really 
interrogating and challenging ideas about how our individual votes are often seen as insignificant. And often you did this by emphasizing that so much of what we want to achieve can be achieved through collective power. Allegra, I'm thinking of your essay in particular about the climate crisis when you rightfully acknowledge um, that an overemphasis on individual action is a recipe for despair. Um, and you kind of point out that while there's nothing I can do, there's everything that we can do. Um, again, emphasizing that, that cumulative potential. Um, and so your piece has really inspired me to think about the limitations of voting as well as the, the collective power of voting. And I saw a parallel to that same dilemma, but in the context of art making and writing more broadly, because from an undergraduate perspective, I've spent so much of the past year in creative writing classes or student run workshops in extracurriculars where my classmates and I are writing against this backdrop of, you know, global pandemic and police brutality and natural disasters that are really exacerbated by the climate crisis and all these different events that stem from very interrelated forms of violence like white supremacy or the legacy of colonization or capitalism and so many interrelated forms of oppression. And in the midst of so many of these issues, so many people my age, um, you know, we're coming to the point in our lives where we can vote, uh, many of us in the US for the first time. And we're also coming into our voices as writers and we're wondering, you know, much as many of your essays wonder, do my vote, you know, does my vote matter here or there? Many of us are wondering, does my voice matter? Do my words matter? Um, and so many of them resonated with me for that reason. And so my question is like in your eyes, what is the potential of writing to enact social change? And when does it need to be combined with other forms of activism and organizing and community solidarity? Because we know that like all writing is political, whether or not it's overtly political, but I'm wondering how your writing informs or motivates your political involvement off the page and vice versa. Like how does your political involvement influence your writing and, and how do you combat feelings of helplessness or irrelevance when considering the singularity of your perspective amidst truly global dilemmas. That was a very long like thought <laughs> process, but if any part of that you know, resonates with any of you, um, whether the part about your creative process and its relation to your political work or just how you grapple with the fact that you're one person um, amidst some of these issues that seem gigantic. Well, it's a really big question, but it was a beautifully put question. And I, I, don't, I don't think that I can speak to all of it, but I, I do know that for me, um, uh, knowing that doing something like voting or, um, or, or writing a story that feels um, like it's grappling with issues that um, matter to me, uh, that feels like part of, um, a, a process of enacting change or reaching towards a better world just by virtue of believing that that change is possible and um, doing it alongside people um, uh, who are who are also voting or also writing past present and future and just knowing that there's um, even if they're not sitting next to you or voting next to you they're also thinking about um, that possibility um, you know, an, an idea I was trying to grapple with in my essay around um, voting, even when it's kind of futile in the moment and your vote isn't going to ultimately elect the, the really progressive candidate that you want, um, it still uh, is, I think, greasing the wheels in a way. It's, it's acknowledging that by participating in, in democracy, you're, you're kind of maintaining a path forward for uh, a, a future a future voter um, and I think um, being connected to both a collective that's participating in the moment and participating a hundred years from now whether in democracy or in uh, efforts to have a sustainable world is that feels that feels meaningful to me Well, I should also Zane, say, sorry. go ahead, Zane. No, go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so I was just going to say, um, now that, that it's completely escaping me. Um, okay. Misha, why don't you go ahead? I'll, I'll come back. Right. I'm so sorry <laughs> that I did that to you. I just, no like, problem. 
got oh. in the middle of your thought. I was going to first say like, Virginia, that's such an interesting, such an, I think, um, I think Allegra has already said what a wonderfully put together question that was, but I was also saying it is so interesting that you've asked about, you know, the, how we sort of like put politics in our work or like how are we interested in how, how much does social justice sort of work in our work. And I feel like as an overtly political writer, I'm always sort of like using politics as a backdrop to tell stories. Like I'm interested in the stories that happen when something big is happening in the world or like in my immediate world and then within those cracks, normal life continues. And sort of, I'm interested in that. And I think in the, in the essays that we are writing here too, for example, um, I feel like I can't escape it. Like I find that wherever I go, I'm looking for the same kind of experience. So when I was in Florida, like, of course I ended up going to the Senate house. And of course I ended up seeing this amazing moment happen. It's both serendipitous and the things that I'm interested in. And they sort of sort of loop around that kind of thing. And, and then I think about the vote and this is something to do with what Alessandro said that he lived in Mexico, right? Like I think about all the times I've lived in other countries that I can't vote. And what does that mean when those countries are in the process of voting? Because you're not part of that system. So even if you have opinions, even if you care about it, you can't do anything about it. And then you go home and you slightly feel disconnected because you are not part of that system entirely either. And I still have to constantly, as somebody who's a glass half full kind of person, I feel like I still have to constantly put my faith in the vote and the idea that one person's vote matters. And in what Allegra has talked about and a lot of us have talked about, that the collective matters that you have to go out collectively, you know, vote, but also collectively tell those stories, like constantly be using stories or um, using stories and sort of art as a way to change the world. And I know that the essays that I read sort of, you know, changed things for me, like looking at what Alessandro, you know, was talking about, or what Zane was talking about, or what Jess was talking about, or any of the other essays I've read, like S.J. Sindhu or Emmett Almala's experiences, like, I think, Emma does a really good job of talking about living in the middle, like after he has become a US citizen and after he can vote, like how does that still feel to him? And there's that liminal space that he still occupies. So thank you for that. Um, Zane, do you, did you remember? I'm so sorry. I found my train. Um, yeah, so I was just going to say that um, the, 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 I can answer, uh, I think I can speak to the fact of, you know, what, what writing means in this context to me and I think it for me it literally is something to start a conversation with it not on like a kind of large scale uh thing with you know having a conversation with the entire country but at least having a conversation within my own university because that is something you know the universities become these these bubbles of conversation in places like Pakistan because they become the only places where you can have conversations on things like the vote and on things like democracy. So if nothing else, I'm sure that at least my students are going to read what I've written and I spend a lot of time having these conversations with my students. They're not gonna read it because they want to tell me how good it was. They're going to read it because they want to come to class two days later and say like, hey, you, tell, you told us this in class the other day and you've done this in your writing, well, how dare you? Um, or something of the sort, um, but at least in, that happening, I'll be able to have these conversations with them. And I think that's something I mentioned in, in my essay as well, that for me, this, for me, activism at the moment seems to be about preparing this army of activists for the future, because it seems like in 10 years or so, the situation here is going to improve enough that institutions will begin to matter. Um, and I think writing does, and creating this, this kind of archive of, of writing on um, freedom and on the vote really matters at the moment in a place like Pakistan, uh, because that will be something for, for people to use as fuel and to draw from, draw from when, uh, you know, some of the more powerful families in the country kind of, sorry, that sounds morbid, but when people begin to, you know, die out, um, it'll, it'll be good for, for everyone else. So yeah, that's, that's how writing kind of helps in this case. I've just realized that Huma has joined us. Hi, Huma. She can't be here, Hi. Video, but she's like sort of, hello. Um, Hi, Misha. I'm, so I'm sorry, I was having some technical problems, yeah. 
that's totally fine. Actually, my next question was for you, and I'm so glad that you're here. And Virginia, I'm so sorry I'm not giving everybody else a chance to answer your questions. Like I think Allegra, Zaid, mm -hmm. and I got in our answers. But um, so mm -hmm. one of the things that I wanted uh, to ask Huma specifically is like, what is it meant? Like, I think that you've talked about this, what it means to try to vote in Kashmir. Um, and her essay is mm -hmm. the one that's coming out next. Like, um, and also like the idea that you, I guess I just want you to talk me through, um, we, we had this sort of conversation about what we left off the floor, like what we didn't put in our work. And I thought about your essay and like how incendiary already that essay is and how the mm -hmm. writing of that essay, the act of writing that essay meant that you, your position in India was threatened. And I'm curious mm -hmm. about like, about like what, if anything you left off and you're willing to talk about it and the experience of just writing this essay and what it means as a writer to write about the vote in a country like India. Right, I mean, I don't know like if uh, everyone is familiar with uh, Kashmir because it's a small, uh, you know, a place in India, uh, you know, controlled by India, uh, is technically right. But uh, it, well, vote is technically uh, nothing for me, you know, no, nothing for Kashmir, uh, because, uh, I mean, we don't have the freedom to make uh, our, to make our own uh, choice, you know, because like, if you are voting, it means that uh, you're being forced uh, you've been forced to 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 vote for a country that uh, you don't consider your your own. Uh, so yes, yeah, so it is. Uh, it means nothing. But I know, like in the essay, I talked about like how uh, when uh, you know during my first elections in Kashmir, like you know uh, when I turned eighteen how when uh, paramilitary forces were kind of like dragging people out of their uh, out of their houses to the polling places like you know how that that moment kind of is uh important for all, all of us because that was a moment when we felt oh well I, we feel like our, our voice is important you know like even though we've been struggling but um but you know it, our, our, our voices are important uh, uh, because otherwise like other than that uh, even if you're talking you know they they were being dragged to the polling stations so that the national channel can you know videotape them and show uh to the rest of the world or maybe to india or what was not reality um but you know at least like for us that was the moment when we were like okay we're going to stand up for uh for our right and uh we just don't want to do that and even if we get some beatings that's fine but we just want to have our uh, voices heard so yeah so and as far as like you know leaving out stuff i mean i've left out a lot but not just because i like, i was scared um i just want to be my uh voice heard and i guess like i just uh wrote what i felt was important for the piece no, that's great. Like, I think there is an urgency um, in the material that we did end up publishing. And I think that's the interesting part. Like, what do we feel in the moment? Like, what feels urgent in the moment? When I was writing the introduction for Art in the Moment, I thought about it. Like, at first, I thought it would be amazing to sort of, like, touch upon everybody's work, to sort of be like, you know, just said this and sort of, like, this essay speaks to that essay. And sort of do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But as I began to write, I realized that I wanted to also tell the story of what makes like newspapers and what made newspapers important to me and what made the vote important to me. And especially in light of, and I feel like I have that in common with Alessandro, like I wrote about my father and I wrote specifically about the fact that he doesn't vote and how frustrating mm -hmm. it was for to be raised by a man who taught us to vote and told us to engage in social mm -hmm. justice and then kind of stood on the side and didn't do it. And what does that mean? What does that bring out in me? Or for example, um, to be in Florida and to be able to see this amazing change happen because of a book that was written by, um, a, you know, a book that was, a, a book called Devil in the Grove, Thurgood Marshall, The Grove mm -hmm. and Boys in the Dawn of New America written by Gilbert King. A book that was so mm -hmm. well-researched, forensically well-researched that sort of, led to an apology 
from the Florida Senate to the descendants of these four men who had been arrested, mm -hmm. wrongfully arrested, and some of them died in lockup, like one of them was lynched, um, were arrested for the rape of a white woman. And it has been clearly proven that that didn't happen, even though she claims that, even now she claims that that happened. And there's this interesting thing where you watch in front of your eyes, uh, the power of words, this, this whole group mm -hmm. of men and women stood up and apologized to these families. And I watched this one woman say again and again, I, all my life, I thought my father was a rapist. And that realization, mm -hmm. what, what you thought, what was, you know, given wisdom, like, or received wisdom and knowing that, and no, you know, knowing that that's not true, but how do you hope when you have nothing, you don't see any proof. And all these years later, somebody writes a book and that book, mm -hmm. me, you know, those stories are told in this wonderful, meaningful way, but also forensically accurate. And you have a moment of catharsis. An apology is not enough, of course. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the mm -hmm. fascinating thing. That's also the impetus for this project is these moving essays. And what do those essays mean? And this idea of like, again, I'm harking back to Alessandro's essay, which is like every vote right. is a bow, right? Mm -hmm. What you said, mm -hmm. you also pointed out, like, you know, now is a moment where you get to, even though you don't care about the vote, you get to use the power of that vote. Like, yes, we're going to, our bodies are going to be um, used sort of like, you know, are going to be broken into and beaten, but we get to say this thing. And I think that's fascinating that, you know, to make that right. choice I mean, I, for the collective. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, definitely. I think art has, um, a bigger part in changing the, the world than anything else, you know, because it's, the, I think it's the most intimate and deep seated expression. You know, a lot of people would say, well, you know, you lived through violence, you don't have to read about violence, but no, I, I learned to write, like Frederick Douglass said, you know, um, you know, I, one thing he said was like, you know, until he learned, he couldn't conceptualize some ideas, you know. Uh, in, in order for him to write about them. And um, yeah, I mean, I've lived through violence and war, but I had to read uh, w war books, you know, war stories. Uh, so I could just not just write as a, uh, you know, as a victim, but also as a witness. So I'm, you know, so I'm kind of like looking at that uh, from a distance, you know, um, from a different point of view. Um, so yeah, it's like, you know, and also, uh, you know, it, it's power to, to kind of like, because uh, it's going against the status quo. And then, you know, like how it kind of like uh, harmonizes the, the world, you know, uh, I think it's just great about art, you know. Uh, yes. So yeah, like, books are really important. I mean, as a writer, I think I can't even, even write a word without reading uh, you know, books about what I'm writing about. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Uma. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for those. Yeah. Um, Jessica and Allegra, I know each of you are from New Hampshire and each of you either identified directly in your essay or in other informal conversations, how that was formative to your feelings of voter optimism or um, just other experiences that shaped your relationship to the vote. So I was curious if, if one or both of you wanted to comment on how that has um, influenced your feelings and how that was tied into your essay. I grew up in a very conservative part of New Hampshire where I was othered a lot and bullied a lot because of my ethnicity. And um, so I definitely got a kind of defiant attitude and just felt like almost, even though I didn't really feel like my vote was doing anything for my community because rural marriage is not represented here, I did feel like a nice sense of defiance, like voting almost out of spite for like the little red pocket of New Hampshire that I was in. And who doesn't love live free or die really as a mantra, it's interesting. Um, but yeah, my grandmother had a lot of love for the state of New Hampshire and she can't vote, but it really wasn't until recently, like I mentioned in the essay that she started being like, um, think of me when you vote, <laughs> please. <laughs> things are getting dark. Um, so yeah, I, I think that you can't live in New Hampshire without at least like a little streak of desire to make your voice heard. Um, 
Yeah, I think New Hampshire, by virtue of being the first to vote in the primaries after the Iowa caucuses, just gets a lot of attention that it really does not deserve, but um, gets. And, you know, you do get sort of person by person um, courted by politicians, uh, which has just made voting um, particular, uh, just a particularly conspicuous part of um, my formative years and that sense of being part of the process, uh, for, for, again, for better or worse. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I I was just thinking, like, as you were talking about New Hampshire, I was like, yes, during the elections, we are sort of like looking at that state to see which way it's going to go. And as someone who lived in Massachusetts, like, I have seen that bumper sticker, like so many times. I'm just sort of, I feel like those, um, those state mottos really define the states. Like, I feel like I meet people from different states, and I'll find out what state they're in and I'll look at the motto. And I'm like, weirdly enough, you fit that state sort of you, you, the motto fits that state or whatever. But um, so we're sort of heading towards the end of the panel, but I, I was going to ask one more question before we head into like the Q and A section. And this is actually a question that Jess sent me early on. And she wanted me to ask this of Alessandro and Zane. And she was kind of interested in the way that madness and illness play into both of your essays and sort of how it relates to choice and freedom. And she wondered if you could like talk a little bit more about this. And did you notice parallels in each other's essays? I think madness, when I think of madness, um, the first thing that pops to my head is you, you're you free. It's weird because madness, usually you would say that, I don't know, it's, it's in some way you're restricted um, in your abilities to, I guess, do something. But when I think of madness, I think of just absolute and utter freedom. Uh, if someone calls you mad or crazy, um, they're pretty much saying, oh yeah, you, you do whatever you want to do. And that's, that, that's a word, madness and, and craziness. It's something that's get, that gets thrown around in the country uh, for people who are trying to do something that goes against the norm anyways. Uh, so when I think of madness, I just think of someone who is, yeah, just someone who's who's free. It's, it's strange. Uh, Sandra, I don't know what you think about work, but yeah. Well, I think, it, I mean, it, I agree with you. I mean, when I probably when in my, in my essay, the reference to madness, it's more like the weird experience that you can have in Italy when you go to vote at a voting booth and then, then they are in elementary school, in primary school. So basically you return to your own, if you are living in your own zone for an entire life, you, you when you have the right to vote, you go in the same school where you were a kid and then you you discover that they are empty and, and you find the traces of probably sometimes you go on the walls and see if the same uh, declaration of love that you write 20, well, not 20, but 10 years before are still there. So it's a kind of a generational experience, no? an experience of, uh, and also a ghostly experience sometimes. And uh, in my in my essay, probably I, I link with this idea of ghosts with the idea of the memories of the past in Italy, you know, that, uh, as I said in my essay, uh, was a, a positive, crazy thing to vote after the war. No, uh, it was also crazy to vote after the war in Italy, because basically they were organizing vote booths in uh, in the ruins. No, I don't know if you watched the, the, this amazing movie, the probably the best probably movie of the Italian cinema that is Paisa, and it's clearly that the, the representation of a ruined Italy, you know, completely erased by the war. And uh, I mean, it was crazy, no, to go there, and then you you probably. You, if you search for photos of the first years of vote uh, in Italy, you still see all the ruins, no? And voting on the ruins is well, can be a crazy thing. For, for my generation, probably more than a crazy thing has been a boring thing for many people. I don't know, this, this affection towards the vote for, for, for not my generation, probably the younger generation, is uh, it's, it's hard to fulfill a positive thing because I mean, as you said, and the other said in, in, in 
in our conversation, sometimes the candidates are the same, uh, although no, it's not like uh, someone who pop up, no, and, and and but it's someone who is still there. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, the, the the positiveness, I don't know how to say, of the freedom of the liberation of Italy. Today, as an effect, as I said, in this kind of a dialogue between two, only two parties, an effect, in, is an effect of boredom. So uh, probably we need a kind of a, we need to return to kind of a madness, no? Towards mm. the vote uh, in terms of creative madness, I don't know. No, thank you for that. I'm, I'm so fascinated by this idea of like history and what is archived history. Like I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this, that you can go and watch a movie that talks, that shows us uh, voting in the ruins. Or I think about the first um, images that I've seen of voting in India, the long lines and like Nehru getting elected, or like I imagine it was the same thing in Pakistan. Like you see that and then you also the affect of boredom and that also exists. Like I sometimes listen to people talk in India or like in the United States or my students who were who during the 2016 elections were like, we don't have a good candidate, so we're not going to vote. And I, just the frustration of looking at them and thinking what it must be like to live in a place or to feel that you can afford to not vote, right? In India, it has always felt urgent, but I have friends who think like, we don't have a good candidate or my vote doesn't matter. And because there's a kind of corruption in India where it feels inevitable that certain people will win, we don't do it. But I think the act of voting is just as important, like regardless of what the outcome is, the act is just as important. And I'm still unpacking that. So I appreciate both your answers. And I was going to say, Zane, when you were talking about madness, I was thinking of Leila and Majnu. I was thinking about the idea of the, that famous love story in which Majnu is mad and he has to be mad in order to love Leila. And in being in that madness, he finds freedom. And I think there is something about the love for a country. And I'm not talking about nationalism, I'm talking about patriotism, right? Patriotism is different in the way that you love your country, but you're critical of it. And nationalism is just this blind love that doesn't see anything, that, that just sort of en engenders hate. And I thought that was fascinating, like this, this idea of just archival, you know, this archival history that exists for the vote and also the madness, just the freedom in that madness. Because I think a lot of times when you come from a particular place where you know the vote doesn't matter and you continue to vote, you know, there's a kind of madness like you're doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, except we know that we're capable of different results. Like the world twists on its axis and, and the world changes at the same time, right? Like, um, so, and I, and I hope that the US presidential elections has begun, begun a wave across the world, a different kind of wave. So thank you so much to everyone, you know, who's shown up and thank you so much to the panelists. And now we'll just open up for questions if there are any questions coming through for our panelists. Mm -hmm. Oh, there is a Q and A, right. Um, Virginia, do you wanna take this? Do you wanna read it out and sort of? Absolutely. Um, so Molly Brown says, I moved hearing this conversation and thinking about each of your essays to think about voting and about political action more broadly as an act of imagination, the imagining of a future, a country, a populace that looks different, if not more perfect than the ones we inhabit. A dreaming that acknowledges both the relative power and limits of the vote, depending on where and who we are. I wonder if you all might talk a little bit about this relationship between politics, voting, and imagination, and how, if at all, you find it at play in your lives and in your work. Thank you for that. In the I following think, three uh, hours. I'm, I'm gonna take that. I'm gonna take <laughs> that. Um, Who are we going to? Yes, oh, okay. Well, yeah, I, I feel like it, it imagination has a, has a very big role. Uh, uh, in my writing, at least, I feel like it, it's uh, to me like uh, art is not individual; it's always cultural. Uh, and similarly, when you are, are writing about anything, uh, it needs imagination. You know, because you know you have to put it all together um, to, to express the feelings, and you're taking all these 
uh, abstract ideas sometimes, and then in, in in order for you to 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 make it uh, like you know like uh, to visualize, I mean to make it like uh, to make people to understand that you have to kind of like uh, tr- turn those uh, ideas into images. Uh, so everybody like across the world can can understand it not only you not 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 only what you're saying but uh what this whole culture is all about and i think when you're trying to like make it broader you know when you when you go go from individual to uh, the culture it ought to need imagination at least for me Thanks so much for that, Uma. I know that Alessandro and Zane, you are both getting ready to answer this question, so maybe one of you can. No, first of all, uh, sorry to interrupt, but it was like, <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a joke. I mean, um, I was thinking in this question, this this answer, this question uh, on imagination and body and creative process, you can say, and I was thinking on my, my author, the author that I recommend at the end, no, probably, uh, I choose only one, no, in, and then probably is the one that I didn't have to choose because it's a famous. I mean, I don't know how. And, and now in America, it is Italo Calvino, no, Italo Calvino. It's almost boring to say how it's been recepted in and uh, received in in America and the for the American audience uh, and readership. Um, but what is interesting about it, probably imagination is is that the imagination uh well i'm not a political writer i'm not a consider myself i'm more like a borgesian part of <laughs> side of that party and and if you look at borges from a polit- only a political engaged uh, point of view is very conservative no i mean he was a conservative man uh, and probably Calvino sometimes is was a radical when he was young, then became more conservative, more Borgesian in terms of imaginary. But what is interesting to me is how his imagination travels. And he, uh, when you read, for example, Carlos Fuentes, I'm sorry to refer only to Italy and Mexico. So, I mean, I'm a comparatist <laughs> in the university, but I mean, all the, today I have this focus. Uh, and, and Carlos Fuentes wrote about Italo Calvino as a very political writer. Uh, obviously, is a politics of imagination. It's a uh, politics relates to language. But I think it's important not to link on that. The fact that when when you when you vote, you you bet not only on a last name but also on a program, no, on words, no. And uh, I feel it's interesting how imagination travels, and I think we know, we need to not to forget that. Probably I answer also the the other the other question <laughs> before, but I, this is. My idea is. I have a super quick thing to jump in. Um, so for Roma, since we don't have a home country, although we originated in Rajasthan, our whole concept, yeah, Rajasthan, um, our whole concept of a nation is imaginary. We have an imaginary nation called Romanistan. And though we're not culturally, politically united in a lot of ways, this imaginary idea of a nation does a lot for even just a goal of cohesiveness and unity. And um, I named my podcast Romanistan for that purpose. But (laughs) yeah, I think imagination is incredibly important and can fill in a lot of gaps when you're not where you need to be yet. I think just quickly adding to that, um, imagination, uh, that's a great question. I haven't really thought about it that way, but um, speculative futures right now are big in Pakistan. We recently had this kind of animated short come out called Chere Tabassam, which imagines a future version of Pakistan, which has never happened before. Like all the kind of future versions of the world we get are from, from the West, quote unquote. And no one has ever really tried to predict what the country will be like in the next 20 or 30 years before this kind of short film that came out recently. Um, So I I completely agree. I think the imagination is, you know, what will direct us. And this is also why I'm so hopeful about the future. It will direct us to this kind of version of the future that all of us have been thinking about and all of us have been you know, just just imagining, uh, for want of a better word, uh, in our head, um, and that that is really why I think speculative fiction is becoming, it is the genre of fiction that's really taking hold in Pakistan these days. 
um, and people are writing those stories about the future and they're writing stories about you know their imagined utopias of um, of what a country like Pakistan could be. So I think yeah, the imagination plays a massive, massive role in uh, you know figuring out where we're going to go. Allegra, would you like to? Yeah, I would just echo um, Zane's uh, point about the importance of, um, of of utopian fiction, ultimately. And I think the fact that artists uh, have the capacity to imagine what, what could be, what's possible, to show it, to um, make it alive, to create stories that can live inside people as possibilities. And it can be in a big picture way, you know, visualizing a, um, a sustainable city, or it can be in a very small way, just reframing, say, public transportation as a positive space where good things happen and romances flourish, and not rather than, say, like uh, a really uh, depressing um, setting, uh, which is often how it's uh, depicted in, um, in movies and, and uh, and other spaces. So I, I'm, I would also shout out to the utopian imagination and how uh, essential it is. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, Molly, that's such a wonderful question. Thank you for asking us. And Allegra, I love that you picked up on public transportation, considering America's interesting relationship with public transportation. Um, and I, I wanted to say, I just wanted to add one little thing before we begin to wrap up. And that is that I was talking to Savankan Tamavongsa, whose amazing book, How to Pronounce Knife, has like had a stratospheric rise and she's just won the Giller Prize and et cetera. And when I was talking to her, she said something really interesting to me. She said, you know, before even hope comes imagination, you have to imagine in order to, you know, you need to imagine a thing before you can even hope about it. And I thought that was such a smart thing because it begins there, right? Like hope begins somewhere. And I think it begins in our imagination. We see the world in a particular way. We see an organization in a particular way. And, and then that thing can, you know, then you begin, you imagine it, then you begin to hope for it. Um, so thank you, Molly, for that mm -hmm. question. And I'm just going to, we're gonna end. There's one more question that's come in and it's come in from our editor, the wonderful Nicole and she thanks Thank, thank you, thanks all of, uh, all of you for your generous conversation and for your contribution to this project. Um, she's hoping that we might share, that all of us might share um, writers we consider as North, star, North Stars, which who provide clarity and guidance for our work and which literary traditions you work to honor and expand. So like the writer that you know you sort of hold on to, the writer that gives you the sort of clarity and guidance. That's a, that's one that makes you think. Right? I can I can go first. I yes. I want to give a shout out to the book that I wrote about in my essay, which is the end of protest, mm -hmm. uh, a new playbook for uh, revolution by Micah White, which is which is <laughs> well marked. Um, and Micah White was, is was one of the founders of the Occupy movement, and I just found um, his writing about thinking about activism and thinking about how uh, to create better futures um, to be really useful to me as a, as a fiction writer, trying to work with imagination. Um, and I think as far as literary traditions, I'm really uh, um, excited about how fiction can be um, written in a way that uh, embodies a collective consciousness rather than um, an individual perspective. So writers who are, who are working with first person plural, for instance, uh, is a, a tradition um, that I um, hope to honor and expand. Thank you. I am continuously obsessed with the Romanian Romani poet, uh, Romanita Mihai Cioaba. And it's difficult to put her in a literary context because Romani writing is largely ignored. <laughs> but um, if I were going to get to name it, it would be, I would call her part of like the Balkan Romanas Renaissance. Like there was just an explosion of um, Balkan Romani writers in the um, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And um, I love her work because it centers a lot on women's lives and this sort of interesting 
spot of divinity. She has a poem called The Apparition of Shahani, which is a retributive like witch who punishes you for not being Romani enough. Um, but she comes and she makes out with the um, main speaker in the poem. And it's actually this really gorgeous moment of acceptance, acceptance and identity and makes a little room for queerness. And um, I just always want to write love poems to goddesses and have them be super queer. <laughs> My North Stars keep changing every week, every month, every year. Uh, but right now it's, it's Daniel Khams, uh, this Russian uh, poet writer um, from Stalinist Russia. Because um, especially his collection, Today I Wrote Nothing. Um, and it's it's just absurd is and we're speaking about madness and we're talking about freedom and uh, I don't need to look further than that particular writer just to think about how free writing can be uh, and how how much you can really get away with um, and also just imagining because I've read a lot about him imagining him on top of a fridge as it was once described in a biography of his uh, narrating poems uh, in Stalinist Russia. He's someone who kind of made this artist's collective um, in his little apartment and there'd be dancers and poets and magicians and just everyone who in any way um, could, could resist the, the bleakness of, of, of Russia at that point in time. Um, and yeah, uh, he is wonderful. He's currently my, my North Star and probably will be for a very long time. Alessandro, do you want to go and then Huma? Well, as, uh, as I, I, I also read and every week I have an author or something that, I mean, the last author that impressed me because, but well, impressed me because probably I found uh, interesting um, opportunities to compare my my culture that is uh, unfortunately only Italian in a sense. No, wait, not only Italian, but I mean, is is my root? No, it's my main root that I, you constantly recreate. But it's unexpected. I found a, a coherent uh, link between uh, my tradition and the Philippine American. Uh, I have the book here, and I found this book amazing uh, like the other one in Surrector. I don't know if you know Gina Postol and uh, uh, this book is about the, the the history of the Philippines not how it's been uh, uh, erased and, and uh, full of violence uh, first uh, related to the Spanish Empire and then to the American occupation uh, so I found that it's interesting uh, because I, I had a, an interview with her a dialogue with her uh, last week and, and she, she said basically that uh, the Philippine is a nation created by a novel, that is a novel by a, a Philippine author. And this, my opinion is really interesting because we as Italian consider ourselves created by a novel that is the betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni. There's a, mm. a, an amazing new translation by Michael Moore uh, coming out or it already cam, came out, I don't know, last, last month uh, probably. And uh, I found it interesting that you, as an Italian, you, you, you can link you now with another tradition and, and, and see your own tradition as not as a, a matter of, I don't know how to say, but I mean, you think about Italian culture, you think about it kind of a solid, no? But I mean, I prefer when, when writers offer opportunity to, to rewrite my own identity in a more fluid way. Thank you so much. Um, Huma, are you there? Yes. Uh, so I was just going to say, you know, I really, because like I write about, uh, about Kashmir uh, violence, you know, all, all the times. But what I really do, like when I am not writing about violence, what I really do, and I really want to do that more and more, is just to re read, you know, I mean, uh, lately I've been reading uh, Neruda's poems, you know, like poems about, uh, about the coat, uh, about, uh, about the key, like clothes. Uh, so things like that, I think it gives me, uh, it really, uh, you know, that, that idea of contrast uh, to kind of like harmonize uh, that, uh, that violence that's ingrained in my head. Um, and, uh, and I think like all, I mean, the best art is about uh, using this contrast. Uh, it, it, also, it not only helps like, you know, disarm the buildup of sadness in me, but it also gives me hope that kind of like goes back to what Allegra was saying, you know, 
uh, like imagining, like imagination is freedom. And, and like you were saying, you know, freedom and, and this hope that, okay, well, we're imagining it, but maybe someday it will be a, a reality, you know? So yes, um, that's what I've been reading for, for quite a bit. Thanks so much, Uma. And I'm just curious about Virginia, who like was part of this project from the beginning to the end. I was like, what are you reading, Virginia? What's your North Star? I love this question. And the first thing that came to mind for me was actually not necessarily a text, but a moment that I got to witness. I was at the Schomburg Literary Festival in June of 2019 in Harlem, and I had the honor of seeing Sonia Sanchez um, read and, and be in dialogue with some of the people there. And she alluded to this memory of hers when she was writing a lot of love poems and, and people kind of kept asking her, why are you writing about love in a time of war? And you know, the, the span of her career has been through so many different eras of, um, of this country and of national, international political turmoil. And her response was, when the war is over, how will we know how to love? Um, and the whole audience was just in silence. And I think about that often um, when you kind of consider that line between the more explicitly or more quietly political and, and maybe moments of, of still having hope and still having um, connection and intimacy and tenderness in your work in times that are tumultuous. Um, so that is like a North Star of an anecdote. Um, but I think um, I'm in a class right now called Queer Performance with my professor Elliot Mercer and we're studying um, queer traditions and like queer theory alongside performance um, studies and a recurring theme is like how it's something that is very queer to be creating alternate universes and, and imagining realities that you can't actually live because you often have to do so much of your identity exploration in private or in quiet. Um, so I think there are a lot of, of queer poets whose work really like represents that for me. Um, I'm reading Not Here by Human Nguyen right now. Um, I've also really found a lot of inspiration from Life of the Party by Olivia Gatwood. Both of those writers do a lot of um, kind of that funny line between fiction and nonfiction that I think poetry allows for, um, particularly for people who maybe can't be their most authentic self in the present. Um, and I think that's, that's a lot of what's on my mind. Thanks so much for that, Virginia, especially since you like bridge something that Allegra said about, you know, finding love in, in public uh, transportation. And like, I love that idea. I just love it. And like what you've said, like this poet who says, you know, what are we going to do once war is over? Because, and I'm also sort of inspired by what Alessandro and Zane said, because I two books popped into my head. One I thought is Master and Margarita by Bulgakov, which is so famous. But the madness of that book, the devil comes to town, right? And he's like, that's it. I'm here. Deal with it. But also, if you think about the history of the book, when Bulgakov is writing it, and he's writing it for a very specific person, right? Like he's sort of writing for the dictator of Russia and, and their weird relationship and all of that. And then I thought of uh, Kerry Hume's The Bone People, this book that I found years ago in, in Delhi, in the big literary festival that happens out there, I almost missed it. And that book is really about love. It's about the different kinds of loves that exist and about kindness, because that's the thing that I come back to again and again and again in the time that we live in that I think it's, and people have said this better and before me that kindness feels like a radical act, like love feels like a radical act, mm -hmm. like just sort of glomming onto those things feels radical. Um, but thank you for that question, Nicole. And thank you so much to all of our panelists who were here. And thank you so much for the audience who turned up to listen to us for the questions that were asked. Um, we appreciate all the support. Thank you for reading our essays. And uh, I just wanted to say, we, we've got one more, I think, event coming up for the Kenyan Review. Tiana Clark, who's brilliant, is going to be reading for us, I think in two weeks time. So I hope you guys will turn up and uh, have a good evening. You too. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.